using different movies. This was this was one of your choice. So, you know, what drew you? What is your connection kind of with this whole genre or theme? Sure. You know, for me, I was a comic book fan when I was very young. And I remember my father, uh, my late father, uh, growing up in Monticello out in the Catskills out west, uh, taking me to the drugstore to buy comic books. And it was, in a way, an extension of something that he loved to do when he was a kid, you know, probably seven, eight, nine years old around in that area was reading. Uh, for him, it was pulp comic books and detective stories and cowboy stories. He grew up in the 40s and uh, in the 1950s. Uh, and for me, it was superhero comics. And there was a little bit of overlap there with some of uh, DC's heroes like the Green Hornet and the Green Lantern and Batman. Um, who had some of those noir and detective genre elements, but uh, we really connected over that, he and I personally, um, over our love for that, those stories. And, you know, as I grew older into my teens, I sort of grew out of it. But um, uh, when I was in high school, kind of reconnected to graphic novels through Mouse, which is Art Spiegelman's uh, great graphic novel many are familiar with um, in school and, and talking about in Jewish studies. Um, uh, and had a great connection to the Catskills too, of course. I remember seeing on the, uh, the frontispiece the little map of the Borscht Belt and a little star next to Monticello. And I thought, wow, what a cool, you know, that made me feel seen, that tiny little town. <laughs> um, and that was kind of, that kind of opened me up into college to studying uh, graphic novels and graphic memoir as a literature, as an English major. And I just carried on that love for that kind of storytelling through the rest of um, the rest of my life, really. It's it's interesting what you mentioned the mouse because I know that my my at least one if not all of my boys have read that, and that was it, it was funny because as we're going through the beginning of this documentary and they're talking about sequential art, which is not it's it's a logical name, but one I hadn't thought of, and I know of cartoons, and that all of a sudden I was like, wait, like my kids read graphic novels, is is that the same thing? And then and later in the movie they're like. And here's a graphic novel, which is basically a cartoon with a hardcover. Um, in, in your opinion, is there a difference between, you know, is it just the same name or is there kind of a subtlety of the differences? I, I would say yes and no. There is an argument, like you say, that uh, graphic novels is kind of a fancy way of talking about comics, right? It, it, talking, uh, giving that format a different name that sort of lent more legitimacy to these stories in a more sophisticated literary marketplace. I think there's a strong argument for that. Um, at the same time, I do think there is some distinction and um, the documentary got into it a, a little bit, but uh, some of his, uh, Will Eisner's graphic novels like A Contract with God and Fagin the Jew that focused on um, not, not just serious subject matter, because I, I think you do see in the 1970s and the, and the 80s, um, even in superhero comics, exploration of contemporary social issues like uh, drug addiction and violence and et cetera. Um, but more of a focus on recognizable real life situations and characters and domestic settings, um, historic stories, um, that you didn't see as much primacy on before or as much um, realism or sophistication in the storytelling. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think in a way graphic novels and memoir of course too um, are pretty distinct from comics but now uh, we I think for a long time uh, in the field tend to use comics as a, an even broader more expansive container for this medium really that can encompass all different kinds of stories and formats and lengths as well well as you're saying about different stories it i i know that the teachers were like as long as children are reading anything like graphic novels whether it's captain underpants or i actually found um one on alexander hamilton that i'm planning on sending to my nephews and my my college age students like well don't send it yet because he's like the poli sci history guys like let me read it first um and, and I, we even saw in the movie how he used, for lack of a term, the cartoon sort of drawing as an instructional guide. It's, it's, a, it's a great way to educate. So it's not only storytelling, but educational. Yeah, definitely. I, and that, as someone who's an educator, have recognized becoming more and more accepted in the mainstream and classrooms and 
uh, library settings and, and elsewhere where some people previously had um, a bias or an impression that comics were just for kids or were just genre stories, kind of trashy, pulpy, you know, taking these attitudes that, you know, you can see in the film go way, way back to even the advent of comic strips as being something designed initially for kids and then the comics code and uh, Dr. Wortham's, uh, that, tr that trashy book mm. <laughs> uh, referenced here that really gave rise to this, you know, mechanism for censorship really in the comics industry, leaving that aside and embracing this medium as something like you say that uh, can be a strong educational tool, which Will Eisner recognized. And um, I think part of the reason why that is, is because it engages uh, more of our senses, right? It engages a, a visual sense as well as uh, a, a exercising reading. And a lot of librarians will uh, that we've worked with so far through the Big Read, which this year is focusing on a graphic memoir called The Best I Could Do, uh, are telling us, you know, we have kids who come into the library or come into their classrooms who are not readers, self-described, self-declared not readers, but they devour comics uh, and manga, which is a Japanese form of, of comics, wow. devour it. And they say, whatever can help them flex that muscle is all to the good, right? Uh, so one of the questions that somebody had was, have you been to Comic-Con? <laughs> uh, I have not been to Comic-Con, sadly. I've, I've always wanted to. And, you know, funny enough, when I was uh, starting in college, if this dates me a little bit, uh, it was uh, right around the turn of the millennium when the, uh, that first modern X-Men movie came out and then uh, the first of the uh, Sam Raimi Spider-Man movies came out that really blew up superheroes in a big way in mainstream popular culture. Uh, it kind of came at the end of this big comic book boom in the 1990s and really made Comic-Con culture explode. So that was when I first got a sense of, oh yeah, there's these people out there and this big world, you know, out West and even in New York City's uh, Comic-Con, which is pretty big. I've always been curious, but I, I've never gotten to go, unfortunately. <laughs> so then of course, uh, uh, there, the question comes, what about the Big Bang Theory and the amount of time they spend in comic stores? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, that's funny. I, I never watched a lot of that show, but I'm aware that they do spend a lot of time in comic stores. It's something those characters connect over, right? And right. that's another kind of signal to the audience that these are nerds, right? They have this uh, traditionally viewed as nerdy interest in mm. uh, comic books and superhero comic books, uh, especially, right? Um, which I think is kind of interesting and always interesting. Uh, I like to ask kids I work with, you know, do you read comic books? And if they do to say, you know, what's your favorite comic book character kind of can mm -hmm. say a lot about uh, what they what they like, what they want. Um, will you know, can talk about superhero comics as, uh, a power fantasy, right? And for, mm. you know, kids, teens, tweens, you know, uh, and sometimes escapist outlet for them to, you know, live out their desires in a fantastical world. So they're, uh, the characters that they're attracted to can, you know, say a lot about where they're coming from, I think. Mm. Um, and of course, the classic question is, would, would you rather be invisible or be able to fly? It just kind of tells you a lot about a person's psychology, right? <laughs> when we do our interview, we have a meet your neighbor. The, the, one of the questions is, what would what is your preferred superhero power? Um, and, and it's always interesting. Some people are just like to stop time, to be invisible. To I don't know if anybody said fly, which would have been a, a logical one. But um, so one of the questions, uh, which I think sort of ties into it, what what do you see as the future of this medium, whether it's called cartoons or graphic novels? I think the future of uh, this field of this medium is much more diverse. I think even more diverse than you get a sense of, um, frankly, in, in this documentary, which I, I think we should keep in mind, you know, is uh, about 20 years old. It's a bit older, um, but yeah, it's- Yeah, he died it's in 2005 and it's like, that, yeah. wow, yeah. Yeah, and like, just so great to hear from him and from other uh, comic book artists of his generation and the one following like Spiegelman and others. Um, in their own words and see those amazing photographs and all those things I thought was a really good reason to show this documentary. But, uh, you know, kind of naturally, as with a lot of uh, mediums and art forms, 
you know, the boys clubs of, you know, yesteryear and not even that far in the distant past uh, is changing a lot and, you know, largely for the good to become more inclusive and expansive and tell many different kinds of stories mm -hmm. that previously weren't um, either acknowledged seriously or given the, um, the primacy of an authentic lived experience on the part of the author. Um, and, you know, that was really interesting to see that kind of in passing, really, um, that character of Ebony that Will Eisner mm -hmm. talked about and kind of said, you know, I don't think I was being disrespectful in this uh, depiction. But, you know, e even 20 years ago, I think it was, you know, recognized that that was a, a pretty, you know, a pretty grim depiction of an African-American child. And today that conversation looks very different than I think it did even when this documentary came out. So we're seeing now, I think a, a real explosion of artists and storytellers in, you know, again, mainstream comics, but also um, independent writers have more control over the, um, the stories that they're telling uh, and are able to, you know, speak to either their own lived experience through memoir or imagined experience or retell the stories of, um, again, superheroes, for example, that uh, have um, different backgrounds like Black Panther that may be familiar mm -hmm. to some from the recent films born out of the 60s, very much the brainchild of white Jewish creators now being used by black uh, authors and artists, including ta Coates and some amazing names from the literary world uh, to tell stories from a very different perspective. Um, I think this year's Big Read really helps to highlight that because the best we could do, which is the flagship title of our Big Read is uh, the story of a woman, uh, a, a Vietnamese American woman's a bringing by her immigrant parents uh, from Vietnam during the Vietnam War to this country and what that was like. It really is a personal and domestic story, but it's also the story of that culture and the story of what this country was like during the time she came over. And uh, of course, her relationship with her parents, which is very fraught and uh, complex. So yeah, I, I think the future is much more diverse for sure. For those who don't know what the big read is, can you kind of give a little overview? I'm so glad you asked. I absolutely can. <laughs> so uh, the big read is a program of the Poughkeepsie Public Library District where the community gathers around one book. And uh, for um, several years now, over 10 years, um, they have been uh, novels, memoir, uh, this year, for the very first time, uh, the Big Read Committee selected a graphic novel, and more precisely, uh, a graphic memoir, so a, a true story in comics form. Uh, this was on the NEA Big Read list. Uh, the, Big, the Big Read is a program of the National Endowment for the Arts. Uh, this year, we are going it on our own, but chose one of the titles from the NEA's uh, list because we just thought it was a great opportunity to get people who weren't already comics readers or maybe haven't uh, seen or touched one in a really long time to get back into it, kind of learn how to read it because for some it really is a process of uh, learning how to make meaning of words and pictures together. Um, uh, you might even compare it to watching a film, right? You're, you're hearing speech and watching uh, uh, performers in that case uh, make meaning through images. Uh, comics are kind of similar in how they make meaning in many ways. Uh, and to get into stories, um, like I said before, that uh, we haven't seen told before over the historic arc of the Big Read. So along with the Big Read, we also have uh, the Little Read and the Middle Read, which are other related titles in uh, picture books and young adult books that we share with schools all around the area. And uh, in addition to programs that the library does or co-sponsors, libraries all over Dutchess County participate in the Big Read to do book clubs and uh, discussion series, film series, all kinds of other programs that are related or stem from this one title. So I'll, I'll share momentarily in uh, the chat, the website, uh, where you can learn more about the Big Read, where to get your hands on the title if you haven't already, and see what other programs remain through uh, the middle of November this year. I hear you have an amazing magazine called The Rotund uh, that uh, you can find all this information out that uh, 
I'm sure if people haven't signed up yet, you'll let us know how to sign up for that so everybody can be in the loop for all your great upcoming events. Yeah, definitely. The rotunda goes out uh, to everyone in the city and town of Poughkeepsie, so you probably already get it, or maybe it goes to your recycling bin if uh, you don't remember getting it and you live in the area, but uh, that just comes out quarterly. So there are some events that don't make it into that uh, newsletter because they pop up by the end of the quarter. Uh, and we always keep people posted on our email newsletter as well, which um, the, the basic newsletter comes out about once a month. So I would say, yeah, through our website, uh, pokelib.org, you can sign up for our email newsletter if you're interested to hear more about these events as they happen and uh, like our Facebook page or Instagram page and hear more about it uh, online. In addition to that quarterly newsletter, the Rotunda, which lists everything coming out. Um, you can look out in December for the next edition of the Rotunda in the mail, which will cover events coming up from January through March into the new year. And some of the great movies we'll be showing together. <laughs> yes. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I, I have to say, a, a libraries are the most amazing concept of just, I can go and borrow a book and read it and not have to pay and and, and now also movies and this up but it just such a such a concept such a such a kind of a I don't know, mitzvah or you know tikkun olam you're repairing the world by inviting people in um and I I, I will well since I know it's nine o'clock we'll, we'll end with one last question it did you notice in the way he wrote Will Eisner and maybe this is just somebody's comment but it does it does it or does it not look a little Disney-esque yeah, it looks like Will uh, uh, Disney's. Like Walt, Walt, Disney's Walt Disney, right? Signature, right, yeah, with that loopy W and uh, kind of the way the dots over the eyes look. Yeah, definitely. It's definitely this like curvaceous style. It's kind of, um, you know, interesting to get specific into it. And I love that we see so much of the artwork in this documentary mm. uh, that you can really see how this style, had, you know, came out intact and then evolved over time, along with his own tastes and like this broad readership into other kinds of comics too. It's really cool to see, but, you know, compared to some other comic artists uh, that, that may be well known to you from, you know, the heyday of DC and Marvel comics like Jack Kirby, who's featured in this documentary. Stan you know, Lee. A lot of those, we all know Stan Lee. <laughs> oh, yeah, Stan Lee, of course, you know, the writer, creator of many of these uh, characters like the Fantastic Four and Spider-Man, you know, you, you think back to the advent of many of these characters, um, especially early on in the 30s and 40s, they're kind of stiff. They're not necessarily super technically proficient in terms of proportion and other things, but there's a lot of movement. Uh, and with Marvel Comics, uh, a lot of the lines are very uh, straight and orderly. And you know, some of those artists came out of the world of romance comics. So there's a lot of more primacy on uh, the way the, the form and the silhouette looks, but I think Will Eisner is working in a way that's a little more liquid, like the lines are sometimes really fat and luscious and sometimes mm -hmm. really thin, but um, seeing these uh, characters and bodies in motion, uh, even though sometimes they're a little bit exaggerated, I'm thinking of one pretty early on, somebody's literally running out the door and he's really running with all his limbs flailing, kind of pulling his coat on. Uh, just that sense of motion, but also fluidity is really cool to see. And I think, that, yeah, there's a lot of similarity there with uh, some of Disney's early work for sure. And, and punching five people in, in one time. Oh yeah, sure. So. <laughs> classic detective, you know, the shadow, which my father loved. Yeah, that's classic. <laughs> I mean, and he seemed to know how to draw women in his, uh, all the ladies. It was just like, wow, those are very voluptuous ladies. So <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was of high interest to the time with a, uh, you know, readership of largely young boys, apparently, uh, uh, yeah. young boys. <laughs> Yeah. So not again not always super proportionate uh women yes yeah the, the, and and then we'll end with this but it was interesting because you know the the whole the russian thing the that the plot of zion whatever that he he seemed to have run done a counter being like this is all malarkey called the plot i i would really that may be something you and i should like delve into or bring up i don't know something as a an interesting counter argument of something that people don't realize. So that that you and I will have further discussion about that uh, going forward. But um, do want to thank you, Bradley Dugood, for being our wonderful guest speaker and very knowledgeable and helpful and insightful. 
Um, always pleasure working with you. And um, we are happy that everybody was able to join us. And we look forward to seeing you next month uh, for November 18th, The Tiger Within. And uh, remember, November 2nd, if you know any educators, the Never Again Is Now conference, uh, come to our website, www.jewishduchess.org slash events. You can find everything that's going on. And with that, I think we're going to say good night. So thank you, everybody, for coming. Big kisses. Stay safe. And uh, we will see you next month.